Hey, I'm Mike Joseph, and thank you for listening to Detoxicity, a show by men, about men, but for everyone. I hope you enjoy the content of this podcast, and I want to let you know about a few things you can do to support us and our mission to challenge traditional notions of masculinity and create a more communicative, positive, and loving environment for all. You can subscribe to Detoxicity on any podcast platform that you use to listen. We are available just about everywhere. Also, don't hesitate to rate and comment as these help us move up in the podcast rankings. I'm on social media, or at least I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok as Detox Pod Guy. Feel free to drop me a follow. Now I have a Patreon page, yay! And uh, Patreon gives you the opportunity to get cool merch and exclusive episodes of this podcast in exchange for subscribing. Go to patreon.com slash detoxicitypod to find out more. Uh, finally, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, whether you found an episode of the podcast particularly enjoyable or enlightening, or you know someone who'd be a great guest, or you'd like to offer constructive criticism, or if you yourself would like to be on the podcast, hit me up. Reach out to me at one of the aforementioned social media channels, or if you're old school like I am, drop me an email, detoxpod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and take care. So let's say you have a talent. And your talent is in entertainment. Let's say you're a musician, a bass player maybe. And you tour the world, playing your bass, doing shows, getting the adulation from the audience, uh, getting better at your craft as you get older. And then you have a change of heart. You decide that mental health is where your focus is at. And you decide to give up being a musician, a professional musician anyway. And you become a counselor. If making that kind of mid-career shift has any resonance with you, if uh, having more than one point of interest at any given time is uh, something that resonates with you, then you want to listen to this conversation that I have with Bill Harrison. Uh, Bill is a former musician, a bass player, and he, at some point in midlife or later to midlife, decided that he wanted to become a counselor and is now a therapist, primarily working with men in the Chicago area. Bill has a book out. It's called Making the Low Notes, A Life in Music. I'm sure you can glean from the title uh, the gist of what it's about. And Bill talks about the book. He talks about his work, how he got into this work. And he talks about his own journey. And uh, it's a pleasure to have him on the show. So uh, I hope you enjoy this episode, everybody. This is Counselor Bill. Give it up. My name is Bill Harrison. I'm a psychotherapist. In Chicago, my previous career was in the music business. I was a bass player for 40 years. That's what my memoir is actually about. I just released this book called Making the Low Notes, A Life in Music, published by Open Books Press. And there's some pretty funny stuff in there, but mostly it's stories about becoming something that I really wanted to become performing artist, all the struggles with that, plus some of the fun stuff with that, and then deciding at some point in my 50s to transition into this other field, which at first glance seems wildly different, psychotherapy, but it really actually isn't. (laughs) As it turns out, in the course of my life outside of playing gigs, I've done a lot of my own therapy. I was a member of the Mankind Project, which I imagine you and some of your listeners must know about. Yes. I've done quite a bit of work with men in groups. Most of my clients are men, probably three out of four. A lot of them are in the arts, but we do a lot of work on anxiety and depression and how it shows up in men, which can be different than how it shows up in other genders. So yeah, that is me in a nutshell. I have three grown kids. I live here in Chicago. My wife is also in the business. She's a social worker. She's been a social worker for years. Uh, A lot longer than me, let's put it that way. Gotcha. She was the reason I decided that I could maybe go into this field because she was very helpful and something I'd been interested in a long time. So. I guess where we start is what drew you to music? A lot of our guests are either full-time or part-time musicians. Uh, So I I think there's a good common thread there. Yeah. I don't really actually have a good answer for that. I'll just make something up. (laughs) Um, My family wasn't particularly musical, 
both my parents played like my mother scratched around on the viola in high school and my dad was an amateur trumpet player. I didn't grow up with a lot of music in the house. I think probably the thing that most got me interested was it's gonna sound kind of weird, but in the, the middle school I went to, this was in suburban New Jersey, outside of New York City, very, very different from the urban schools I had been to before. This is a suburban school and everybody had to take a music class. Mm -hmm. It seems like ancient history now. And I definitely did not want to be in the chorus, in the choir. No way. Are you not a singer or just well, you're singing something that... No, it just seemed so nerdy. <laughs> and I was already a nerdy kid. So I didn't want to do that. And the only other class they had for non-musicians was music appreciation, which was known at the time as Mozart for morons. <laughs> oh, God. Just telling you how it was. Right. I didn't want to do that either because that was super uncool. So I went to the band director. I was a huge Beatles fan. I wanted to play the drums. A uh, 12 year old wanted to play the drums. Cool I instrument. Mean, why not? Yeah, I wanted to be Ringo. Yeah. And, but the teacher was like, sorry, we have too many drummers. So he just pointed to where the basses were, the upright basses. Mm. Or you can play one of those. I was like, I don't know what that is, but my father was a trumpet player and that was reason enough for me not want to play a brass instrument. So there's some man stuff in there for you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely did not want to be like him. So yeah, I said, I'll take one of those. And I didn't even know what it was. He said, oh, that's a great choice. That's a bass. And then he started giving me lessons. I took to it. I liked being able to play music with other people. There was a lot of camaraderie in music. Sure. In fact, when I talk to musicians now and over the years, the thing we always say that we like the best about it is the hang. What happens in between tunes or what happens in between shows? That's the part we like the most. Everybody has a certain level of expertise, but then we just sort of relax into that and you're in this little special click of people who do that. That's why they have those t-shirts. Don't worry, I'm with the band. So yeah, yeah, I didn't really have an impetus that was anything holy or spiritual or anything like that. It was more like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. What can I do? Well, I'll do this. And that was a whole lot cooler. And I got to be in an orchestra. And then a little while later, I, I became friends with this guy who was a real jazz head. And we started jamming together and I just thought, oh man, this is super fun. So it just kind of went from there. And even when I came to go to college here in Chicago, I wasn't a music major. I was a film major to start off with. And then I just got involved in playing with some really great musicians, far better than me. And I just thought, I, I think I'm going to do that. The rest was, is history. Yeah, the rest is history. Exactly. Right. right on. And you made a career out of it. I guess it would seem on its face to be a really, really hard shift from being a musician to being a, a mental health clinician. But I'm kind of thinking back, I've worked in the music business for 30 years. I know tons of musicians. Most of the people that I know who are surrounded by music do have some kind of uh, issue with mental health, which I think I can extrapolate that to say most people, period, have issues with mental health, but it does seem to affect people in creative fields a little more keenly. I can so, agree with uh, that. So I'm wondering, when did the light bulb pop into your head? About doing it as a profession? And then we'll backtrack from there about how you may have realized that in yourself. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Since I'm very honest about this in my book, I guess I can be very honest about it with you. I felt several things. One, I was in my 50s. And in a lot of ways, I feel like the music business, unless you're maybe in a symphony orchestra, is a young person's world. So I felt like I was starting to age out. Also, I had broken the knuckle on my first finger of my left hand kind of important for a bass player mm -hmm. many years before. And I had a career, but it always hurt. And 
I was getting a little tired of that, not knowing when it was going to be really bad or just somewhat bad. And then a doctor said, oh, you've got arthritis in both those knuckles. I was like, well, no wonder it's hurting all the time. Then I also had some back problems, hauling bases and amps around. It is kind of an occupational hazard. Many of the musicians, especially bass players, but others as well, have lower back problems. Sure. And this is the one that people are kind of like, oh, what, really? I was getting tired, man. I was tired of everything having to do with the music business. Still love music, but there's so much BS around booking gigs, getting to the gig, dealing with whoever you have to deal with. It's not the other musicians. For the most part, the other musicians are fantastic. But clients and who knows what. I felt like I had pretty much done what I wanted to do. There weren't any kinds of gigs I was about to get that I hadn't gotten before. And I'm not saying the transition was easy because it wasn't. Right. But I was kind of done. I just felt like I've been there, done that, physically tired, mentally tired, in pain. I just thought, let me think about what else I might want to do, what I could do without having to stress my body. And also that gives me a sense of meaning and purpose. Mm. And I, I would imagine working in mental health gives you a great deal of meaning and purpose. Definitely. Uh, but s switching to that, I, it couldn't have possibly been easy. But what gave you the motivation to kind of push through with it? <clears throat> well, pain's a great motivator. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. It's a really good question. I had been interested in psychology my whole life and various times when the music business really dropped out, like right after 9-11, mm. a terrible time in the music business, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. And then 07, 08, that crash really put a dent in a lot of our incomes. So part of it, I think, was speak, be, being tired was kind of not knowing when was I going to ever have an income I could relax around. Right. Not that I'm making a ton of money. It's just that I can pretty much count on it. Whereas in the music business, if you're a freelance guy, first of all, you feel like you can never say no, right? Because when don't you need the money? Right. And just the randomness of it, the arbitrariness of it. And that was very stressful. And one of the issues I've dealt with over the course of most of my life is depression. And so when I first realized that I was in therapy, this was in my 40s, I guess. And my therapist said, have you ever, anybody ever said I, that you're depressed? And I was like, no. Uh, so he was the first one to call it out, like, man, I think you're depressed. And it was such a relief because I had felt that way under the cloud basically my whole life, as long as I could remember. And I always thought, oh, I must be doing life wrong. Mm. Everything about this is my fault. And I got to say that friends and family weren't much help with that because people say, oh, come on, just snap out of it. Go for a walk. Come on, uh, do some exercise. Get better did you, ever, did you ever get the think about other people who have it worse? Oh yeah, that was in the mix for sure. Yeah. So I first I thought it was my fault, and then I was getting a lot of reinforcement for that. Why are you such a sad sack? Why don't you have any energy? All these things. Meanwhile, I was living my life and doing things. I raised my kids and had a career. But it was hard to get through with all that until this guy finally said, I think you're depressed. And I started crying. It was such a relief to have a professional say, I think there's actually something going on here. Right. It's not, you're not causing this. It's not in your head. I mean, it is in your head, but it's not made up. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So how did we get there? Oh, yeah. So in terms of me wanting to go into this field, really, this particular therapist, he was a big bear of a man. He was very much like a father figure to me. It's just a great guy. He's the one who suggested the Mankind Project to me. And when I thought about what to do next, 
this is long after I had stopped seeing him, I thought, if I can do something for other people, something like what he did for me. For you. Mm. So I think that's kind of where sort of the germ of a thought about it came from. Also, we weren't married yet, but I was involved with this woman who was a social worker, and I saw what she was doing every day and how much it meant to her. And she would talk to me about her clients. I know we're not supposed to do that, but she did. <laughs> Anonymously, of course. Right. So that was a big influence too. And she knows that I'm very grateful to her for that and for helping me just kind of get through it. And she was like a second supervisor for me all throughout my training and into my supervision years. Even now, we sometimes talk about cases on a very professional sort of level. And now I've gotten to the point where I can point things out about something that she's dealing with in her practice. Right. So I don't know if I've answered your question. I think you have. Backtracking a little further, was there a defining moment that kicked you into therapy? Was there something that happened where you were like, okay, this is do or die time. I need to go see a therapist. Or was it just like a gradual, maybe this is something that might work for me? No, it was definitely a thing. I don't really want to talk about it in detail. That's fair. There was a kind of a, uh, I don't like to use the word trauma because it's such a buzzword these days. This wasn't the kind of trauma, capital T, this was a lowercase t, in the midst of my family, and it just knocked me completely off my horse. And I just thought, well, I didn't think therapy. I just was like, okay, now. It was friends who suggested to me, you might want to see a therapist. I was like, what? Mm. Therapy? That's for crazy people. Come on. <laughs> this was the 1980s. Right. I didn't know any better. Actually, no, that's wrong. That was a lie. This was the early 90s. I wish I'd been in counseling in the 80s. That would have been really good. I wish I was in counseling when I was a teenager. That would have been really good, too. But yeah. It, I was, right? Yeah. So, yeah, there was a tumultuous event for sure. And I, I went into therapy very reluctantly. And my first therapist was terrible. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people, I think, I see, sometimes I say a lot of people and I really mean me. Oh, yes. So I need to stop doing that. <laughs> yeah. I, when I went into therapy in my early 30s, I knew nothing about anything. I only knew one other person who was seeing a therapist. And I didn't realize that sometimes the client and the clinician might not necessarily be the best fit. And it has nothing to do with them. It's nothing to do with you. It's just like not every two people are going to click. And there's a good parallel to the music business or music as an art form. You can get the greatest, I think about rhythm sections especially, you can get the greatest drummer, the greatest bass player, the greatest guitar player, and you put them together and it just does not work. Right. I've had that experience many times of, oh, I really want to play with this guy. And then the, when it happened, it was like, oh, no, this is wrong. Through no fault of anybody's. You're right. really good at what you do. I'm really good at what I do. Doesn't matter. It's a complete intangible. That's right. So you should never let one bad experience discourage you from the practice as a whole. And I, I've told that to people. Uh, yeah. Now having my own experience, having been through multiple therapists, some people are good for you. Some people are not good for you. Some people are only good for you for a particular amount of time. Agreed. And I, I think a common thread with a lot of people I talk to and people that I've spoken to for this podcast is just the resistance of wanting to find somebody particularly, I mean, everybody I talk to is a guy, but I think that is a uniquely male thing. Oh, yes. And you work primarily, I think you said three out of every four clients you have yeah. a guy and is that by design it's by self-selection from clients okay not that i don't like working with women because i do and i even have a couple of trans clients so i'm fine with whatever but for reasons unknown to me i get more calls from men also the acting business and the music business tend to be more male dominated. And I would say if I had to put a demographic, I would say most of my clients are either musicians or actors. It's not entirely true. I've got a painter. I've got some writers. I have a, an opera singer. I guess they're a musician. 
Yeah, so, that's a musician. <laughs> oops. <laughs> Sorry. That's not a Sorry. Freudian slip. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, but you were saying about finding the right person. The word affinity comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think there's these different connecting points. I'm trying to think of a good analogy. <clears throat> Maybe it's some kind of an electric device where there's multiple connections that need to be made. And sometimes you're aligned and sometimes you're not. So these different affinity points are like, what do you do for a living? Your gender, your race, your religion, your age, where you located, mm-hmm. urban versus rural. There's so many different demographic things that come into play with this. And there's research behind this that says that in general, people do better in therapy if the therapist is more aligned with who the client is and vice versa. Right. Now, that's not always true, but in general, I think it's true. And that's one of the reasons I think my caseload is largely performing artists because I advertise that and people come to me, I think, because of that reason. But I think what, the reason it works primarily is because they don't have to explain the thing to me. They don't have to explain what they do. We're already there. Right. So I always make this comparison, but veterans in general don't trust non-vet healthcare people. So if you're going to work for the VA, you're much better off having been a veteran which I'm not right? because veterans with good reason don't necessarily trust or want to open up to people who have not had that experience. And I'm not comparing being a veteran with being an artist by any stretch. It's just different. And we're not in a life threatening position, but there is something about that. This guy gets me because he knows what it's like to have been auditioning, performing, going through all the stuff you go through, worried about getting another job, doing well enough on the job so you don't mess up and get fired or all the things. So I think that's another affinity point or whatever. I've never used that language before, but it lines up really well so that we can skip a whole lot of the introductory material. You don't have to explain, like if I get somebody from the corporate world, Over years, I've learned about this, but at first I was like, I don't get it. How do you get a job? How do you go to, a, I was going to say an audition for a job, but how do you, I have no idea, man. How, how do you interview? I don't, I don't know. I never did that. So yeah, yeah, that is super important in a lot of cases. I mean, just speaking from personal experience, the overwhelming majority of my therapists have been men. I just think when there's an affinity, it cuts out in a few sessions. It right. eliminates the need for some elements of explanation. And that's obviously not true for everybody, but for me, that has been the case. There's some similarity experience. Yeah. And I'm wondering, because you have clients who do not fit that experience, whether they be, you mentioned having trans clients, you have clients who are maybe not in the performing arts industry. I'm assuming you have clients of color. You might have clients who are on the queer spectrum. Yeah. And there is, I guess there's two points here. I mean, one, there seems to be a dearth of clinicians that fall into any of those categories, which is kind of an issue in and of itself. It's a big problem. But also as a straight white guy, (laughs) how do you involve yourself in conversations or how do you find relation points with your clients who maybe have a different life experience than you do? Yeah. Well, that's a really great question, Mike. I'm glad you asked it. And part of my answer is going to be, I'm not sure. But another part of my answer is, just like I think in relationships, whether it's with a close friend or a partner, lover, again, depending on the people, the specific individuals, if we can find enough 
points of contact where we can, and I say we, but really more, I mean, the client, if they feel able to trust, to build that, to be willing to take the leap of faith, to build a a relationship with me, then we can probably get there. I'm just thinking about the different demographic things you were talking about. So the two trans clients I've worked with are both musicians. Right now, I have a couple of gay clients who are both actors. I have one uh, man of color was just a long-term client, been with me for a long time. And I think we just hit it off personality-wise because he's not an artist and he's a younger man. He's in his 40s. But for whatever reason, he decided that he could trust me you know, way, way back and have a great, re- really good working relationship and have for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily think chemistry is as easily definable as demographics are. That's right. right. Yeah. I mean, my current therapist happens to be straight and white and probably 15 to 20 years younger than I am. Never trust anyone younger than you. (laughs) First advice. You know, I I, I learn a lot from younger people. I I do. Yeah. So it's a great thing to have that. And again, chemistry is intangible. You don't know who you're going to have it with. Sometimes you're surprised by who you do not have it with. Yes, that's true. There have been definitely times when I just thought, oh, this is our first session. I thought that went great. Wow, we were all hitting on all cylinders. And then I never hear from the person again. Again. Not norm, not usually, but every once in a while. It happens. Okay, what, what went wrong? Right. And it could be, you're never going to know. It could be one of a million things. That's right. Yeah. Right. I mean, if it was ethical to call the client up and say, hey, just for a customer satisfaction survey, why didn't you come back? We can't really do that. I've asked this question about several of the clinicians that I've had on the show in the past who work primarily with men. What do you see or what is your experience as far as the common things that men come to you with? What are some of the common issues? I would say depression, anxiety, no surprise there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would also say relationship difficulties, probably a a high third on that. Anger issues, which in my mind are very often linked to depression. I don't exactly know how to say this, but my language for it is men who are kind of stuck in the man box. Uh, And because so many of my clients are in the arts, in general, that's less of an issue. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, but there are people who are really good at being able to express themselves on a stage or behind a saxophone who have so little ability to communicate verbally with their closest people. And it's a real problem when you're trying to have human relationships. <laughs> yep. So there's definitely some of that as well. Can you learn how to be more emotionally intelligent in the daily world of interpersonal communication? When you're not working from a script or when you're not sitting behind your drum set. Yeah. I don't know that I've actually ever heard anyone use the term man box, specifically on this podcast. I have heard it several times before. In your interpretation, what is the man box, A, and B, how do people begin the process of breaking out of that man box? Because I think all of us, to some degree, I mean, people of all genders are in the man box because we are a patriarchal society. That's true. My understanding, the way I use it is, 
I wouldn't say everyone's in the man box. I would say, unfortunately, and I wish I was wrong about this, but it seems like at least the majority of straight males in this country, I don't want to talk about Europe or Africa or Asia because I, I don't have the experience, but <clears throat> grew up with these crappy beliefs about what it means to be a man. And it's not just machismo, but that encompasses a bunch of it. Like everything I'm going to say is going to be a cliche, but that's the problem. All right. All right. right? Men don't cry. You can't show any sort of emotion that indicates weakness or vulnerability. That's maybe even a better word for it. Like, mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you can't be sad. You can't be afraid. What else do we have in there? You can be happy. You certainly can be angry. Right? And so because it, we've grown up to believe that being vulnerable, showing that we're sad, or afraid is a sign of weakness. We just decide to bury those things. They don't go away. Right. right. They're there. And so it's like we've chopped off a couple of our limbs, emotionally speaking, in the interest of preserving this fiction that we're actually not entirely human. No, we don't have the full gamut of human emotions, which of course we do, but we just don't allow ourselves to express them. And then <clears throat> so much of it comes out as anger and sometimes violence, verbal abuse, child abuse, all the things. So that's kind of the worst part of the man box. I think other parts of it have to do with capitalism. What makes a man is somebody who climbs the ladder, makes money, and has this kind of house or that kind of house or this kind of partner or that kind of partner. And what kind of car do you drive? What's the first question men ask each other at a cocktail party or at a sporting event? Hey, what man, do what, do for you work? Do? what do you do? Yep. Yeah. And then you're defined by that. Yeah. I'm sure you've met some guys who they only want to know what kind of car you drive. I mean, I live in New York, so not uh, okay. so much a Never mind. question. Yeah. Never mind. Never mind. Okay. All right. So then in New York, so what neighborhood do you live in? Absolutely what, right. Where, where the first question is usually, what do you do for work? And then the second question is, where do you live? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but then I don't. So here's another part of the man box is. We're so afraid to go further than that with other men. If you're talking to a woman, now, again, broad brush, and she asks you a personal question, I think a man is much more likely to be able to <clears throat> give some kind of a response that's a little more vulnerable, vulnerable if they feel like they're talking to a woman, someone who's not going to judge them for being soft or being weak or something like that. Again, not always true. Right. There's plenty of judgmental women in the world. But I think in general, as a straight guy, I think most of us would be less inclined to think, oh, this guy is trying to find something out about me so he can dig in, get the knife in there, whatever we imagine. And it's usually just imagined. Right. I really do believe that m most men would prefer to have more intimate relationships with other men. I think it's a huge missing piece in our culture where we feel like you can't tell your friend how much you love them. It's not okay. It's like, I'm fortunate to have friends now. Thank goodness in my seventh decade now, or what decade am I in? Sixth, I guess. I don't know, Bill. That's the question only you can answer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm 66. Is that my sixth decade? It is just oh, seven. Seven, seven. Yes. Finally, thank goodness, I've got some friends that we can talk to each other. It took a long time. 
to get there. And I, I feel sad that it did because there's plenty of friends I've loved over the years and just we do the hitting on the arm thing. And I'm not a, anything like a macho dude. You can see I'm not the way I talk and everything. I'm not that. But it's but, still built in. It's ingrained. Exactly. There, yeah. There's the box. It's like a built-in scaffolding that takes concerted, concentrated, patient effort to break out of. And one of the problems is we don't even know that we're in the box, right? It's like, does the fish know it's in water? Mm. It's there. It's assumed. It's part of the cultural context. So I get a little frustrated with, with this. And actually, right here, I'm working on my second book right now, which is all about my relationship with my father, who was a quite complex character. I'll just leave it at that for now. I think with time, the man box is becoming less and less of a thing. I hope you're right. Yeah. Maybe I'm fooling myself. I think I'm seeing progress. I'm not seeing enough. And I think in certain communities, the man box is bigger than in others. Tighter. Tighter. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yes. But I, I do think there is a fair amount of conversation now about the dangers of patriarchy and the dangers of quote unquote toxic masculinity. And there are some people who are actually searching or who have the tools, right? Because when I was in my twenties, even as someone who was beginning to identify as queer, there was still a lot of the man box left in me. It was very hard for me to show vulnerability around other people. I mean, not even just men, just hard to show vulnerability, period. And there was this strong sense of what is masculine and what is feminine and what you can do and what you can't do and what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Right, right. That I think a combination of therapy, exposure, and queerness kind of broke me out of over time. And even then, I was 40 around before that even really became a thing to me where I, I realized that the masculine way in which I had been raised and socialized was damaging in any ways. I think whatever you call them, Gen Z or whatever it is, I think particularly folks who grew up in cities are maybe a little bit more exposed to more open-minded ways of being. There's a little bit less strictness in the man box, but still these days you still see, I, I think still the majority of Americans. And I do agree with you that this is probably maybe not largely an American thing, but it's definitely an American thing. These kind of strict rules around what is considered masculine and what is not, and not being able to be vulnerable, not being able to show weakness, all of that, like you said, and I think I'm just kind of repeating what you're saying, what you said earlier now, it's not like it disappears, it's suppressed. And when it's suppressed, it finds its way out. You hold in a fart long enough, it's going to get out. The language I have for that, not for the fart part, is that it comes out sideways. Right. Comes out at times and and in situations where it's inappropriate and damaging, probably not only to you, but to whoever you happen to be with at the time. I think a lot about how we can get more people to consider therapy as a viable option. I I think one way would probably be to make it more affordable, which is a whole nother conversation. Yeah. And not to toot my horn in it really here, but I have set aside 20% of my practice for people who can't really pay a normal fee or don't have insurance. That's amazing. Because you work with a lot of creative people who are in a gig economy and don't have insurance. Don't have insurance, don't have much money. Right. So yeah, it's an underserved, I think it's... The population of artists is for sure an underserved community, but I'm fortunate that I'm a middle-class white dude and most of my other clients have insurance. And so I can afford to, to set aside these slots every week for people who are paying 25 bucks or whatever they can afford. And it's actually great. I, I love all my clients, but... If I didn't have that set up, first of all, they probably wouldn't be in therapy. And second of all, I wouldn't get to know them. 
Right. Which would be a huge loss for me. So what do we do to convince more guys to go to therapy? Mm. Because I think when we're talking about men, it's not necessarily a money thing. Right? That may be part of it. I mean, I think it's a few things. I think in some cases, it's cultural. A lot of brown people have been taught to not share. In addition to masculinity, there's a sense of family secrets and not wanting to share those things, take those things with you to your grave. Yeah, but I, go to your pastor. Right, right, exactly. But I think just with men overwhelmingly, going to therapy is seen as a sign of weakness when, and I'm not going to be a walking, talking meme, but there are memes out there that say, actually, it's a sign of strength. And it's a sign of belief and faith in yourself that you want to make a better version of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. People who think it's a sign of weakness clearly have never been in therapy because they don't know how hard it is. And you have to be courageous. In my opinion, you have to be courageous to be willing to face yourself. You were looking at yourself butt naked in the mirror for at least an hour every week. And usually for a long time after that. Right. It's not you, easy. If you're going to do it, you're going to have to deal with uncomfortable material. And who likes that? Yeah, I, I think I'm better with it now. But the first few years that I was in therapy, I would have a session where I would leave it and have to deal with all of these uncomfortable feelings and then kind of be like, oh, fuck this. I don't want to go to therapy anymore. This sucks. I'm supposed to be better. Well, that's a myth, too. <laughs> You might eventually feel better, but the process itself, no. I try to prepare people for that, but it's a hard sell. Yeah, you're uncomfortable. Come to therapy and have a bad time. <laughs> I mean, nobody wants to have a bad time on purpose. Right. Again, evangelizing a little bit here, but I think what I've gotten out of it has really been life-changing in so many positive ways. Yeah, good. And I, I hope that other people have that experience as well. I think the best evangelists are men who have been in therapy and talk to their friends about it. That's such a great question. What can we do to get more men involved in some kind of therapy at work, whether it's individual or in their couple, in their dyad, or in a group? Anything where there's an opportunity to be a little more forthcoming, you know, let down some of that man box guard. And there's still this perception that I had when I was telling you, like, whatever that was 40 years ago, that only really crazy people, sick people go to therapy. It's not right. for regular humans. Right. I it's think it's I would... for people who are going to be in straight jackets one day. Yeah. Right. Which crazy as it seems, oh, I'm not supposed to say crazy. Seem, <laughs> the fact that it's still kind of that way for a lot of people in pop culture now and on TV and movies, there's been so many representations of therapy, which is great. Sometimes it's not so great, but a lot of times it kind of normalizes like Tony Soprano, most macho guy ever went to therapy. <laughs> Robert De Niro in that movie with Billy Crystal. Yeah, analyzes. I'm feeling better about myself. Yeah. But yeah, I'm with him. Like, there's still so much stigma around it. I think part of it, I think most of it is stigma. I think part of it is access, but I do Definitely. think that there still needs to be so much work to be done to eliminate the stigma. And now I got to ask you, why'd you decide to write a book? Oh, I like that question. <laughs> Actually, I think I have an answer for that one. Thank goodness. Okay. So I didn't miss playing an instrument, playing the bass, because of all the physical issues and all the BS surrounding, I was talking about earlier, around the business part of it. <clears throat> but I did feel like I'm not getting a chance to do anything creative. Therapy is a creative endeavor, for sure. But it's ephemeral. It's I'm with this person. And we're really locked in together, and then we're done. And then I'm with this other person. So there's continuity from person to person and session to session, but it's all confidential. I can't make anything 
from that that I can then share with the universe. It's got to be private. Right. And <clears throat> I think I was missing that. I'm kind of a restless person in that sense. I think I just missed doing something expressive. So this was in 2018. I've written my whole life. I've written on, on therapy. I've written on music. I've had a couple of different columns and base magazines and crap like that. And I knew that I really enjoyed doing it. I started blogging. I guess that would have been in the early aughts. And friends would say, you're a pretty good writer. You should do that. And the one good thing I never did with it, which I made the mistake of doing with other things, was to try to monetize it. Sure. I didn't want to turn it into something that I'm doing for money because that would just feel like playing weddings again somehow to me. Right. I just wanted it to be, I do this because I like it. It makes me feel good. I get to express something. Nobody's leaning over my shoulder saying, you can do this, you can't do that. It's my thing. So in 2018, I decided that I wanted to establish a practice, just like you'd practice meditation or the piano or whatever. So I, I asked a few friends if they'd be willing to accept a daily email from me in which I promised to write at least 500 words a day of new material, whatever it was. Wow. Um, well, for accountability, which right. I think is really important. Um, right. I wasn't good enough with it to just do it for myself. I felt like I really needed some exterior pressure in a sense. Not that anybody was ever saying, hey, let me get an email from you today. What's going on? But for 10 months, I did it every day. I missed a couple times in there, but only a couple times. And a lot of times I wrote way more than 500 words. There were days I sent out 2,000 words just because I was on a roll with something. And some of it was junk. Some of it was just like, well, it's raining today and there's a squirrel out there and here's this cute thing my cat did. But a lot of it was actually memoir material. I was writing a lot of stories about my life in the music biz. I wrote a lot of stuff about my family, some of the very vulnerable stuff I would have never shared outside of what felt like this safe container of doing that. There were people I knew who were friends and were not going to come back and say, whoa, you were really a jerk back then, weren't you? you were, sure. You know, the, the only responses I ever got from anyone were very positive. I can't believe you were willing to write things like that. So I generated a ton of material. And then during the pandemic, I had all these documents, thousands of words, and I started to look through and see, well, here's family stuff, put that kind of in one place. And then here's all these music stories and reflections on what it was like to play with Dizzy Gillespie. Or what about that time I played with Max Roach? Or what was it like going to Montreux with Bunky Green, this great alto player from Chicago? And I was like, oh, well, there might be something here. <clears throat> so I just started to assemble the pieces into something that might be book. I didn't ever really say, hey, I'm going to write a book. Because that would have been too presumptuous, I think. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're going to write a book. Oh, now I'm going to do it. Yeah, sure, buddy. Sure. Yeah, you're going to do that. But... <clears throat> I wound up taking some classes in the craft of writing, both in person and online because of the pandemic. And I <clears throat> happened to have some literary friends. My wife is, in addition to being a social worker, also quite an accomplished poet. So she has friends in that world. Some of them were willing to look things over and say, well, this is pretty, this is working and not so good there. And maybe you could do that thing. Then I also, as I got more serious about it, I started hiring bona fide editors. And eventually I found one after a bit of a search who was just phenomenal. And she really helped me whip it into shape. And I wound up with something that I was pretty proud of. I am proud of that seemed to have a nice arc to it. And the stories were, a lot of them are humorous. There's a lot of poignant stuff in there. There's stuff about what we're, we're talking about earlier, about transitioning from being a musician to doing what I do now. 
It's a pretty darn good book, in my mind. You certainly welcome to toot your own horn as much as you want. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten a lot of great feedback from the writing community. I have I've got some amazing blurbs from people who have no vested interest in being nice to me, particularly. And I can't return the favor because I'm nobody. Bill Harrison says your book's the best. <laughs> you know, no, I'm not in a position where they, because often it's like, well, you do my blurb, I'll do your blurb. Right. It's, it's not like that. So from the writing community, also from the music community, I was able to get some people that people know, names that they know. And it's like, so, oh, it's, it's good. If you want to know about what it's like to be a blue collar musician, this is the book. It's not like a rock star or a hip hop artist autobiography or something. It's not celebrity at all. It's a real it's story. Not story. to say that, that other stories are not real stories. Right. But it's a story that right. isn't centered around celebrity or a cult of personality. No, I, I mentioned those jazz musicians because I did have a chance to play with them. And it was like the, my brush with greatness. I did other things too. I got to work in the theater quite a bit in pit orchestras. And when I look back, I go, man, I got to do that. That was super cool. I have a tendency to really downplay it. Like when say, oh, you're playing Wicked or whatever. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, it's just Anybody could do it. Just give them a base. They could just do it. But looking back and more realistically, I go, well, I must have known what I was, something about what I was doing because there's a lot of good bass players in Chicago. They didn't have to hire me. It's worth a pat on the back. I think humility is a great character trait. <clears throat> yeah. However, I think a lot of us push that button a little too hard and you got to let your light shine sometimes. You're not an egomaniac. If you say that you did something cool. That's part and, of uh, it. my man box is right. Yeah. Must suppress, must not get too big of a head. Don't get too big for your britches, Mr. Yeah. Also <clears throat> sharing the cool shit that you did and do gives other people permission to let their light shine. So it's inspirational for some people. Right. And that really ultimately, when you ask, why'd you write this book? That's really my answer is, and they talk a lot about this in memoir craft writing, the more specific your story is, the more universal it becomes. Right. So when you talk about the details of it, people can really relate to how that might have felt. <clears throat> if you skim over things, it's like, well, there's kind of nothing, there's nothing there. There's no meat there. Right. How can I relate? So obviously the feedback I've gotten has been, oh, so much of what you said really resonates with me. I had some very similar experiences, a different story, but a lot of the same. And these are people who aren't necessarily bass players or even musicians. Sure. People can just kind of relate to desire to do something, the difficulties of getting yourself there, sustaining it. What if you lose interest? What's it like to transition out of one field into another? There's a lot of that, that to me is the thing that really makes it <clears throat> worthwhile was being able to feel like, like you said, you tell people kind of how it was for you. It gives other people permission to tell their own story and also to maybe give it some value and honor it. Right. Right. I so, think that's how we learn from one another. Ideally. Right so much appreciation to you, Bill, for taking the time to be on the show and uh, sharing your story with us. Good luck on that second book. I will definitely be checking it out when it comes out. Once again, Bill's book is called Making the Low Notes, A Life in Music. You can find it anywhere there are books, including on Amazon. If you want to know more about Bill or if you are interested in his therapeutic services and you are in the Chicago area uh, or the state of Illinois, please contact BillHarrisonTherapy.com or you can email him at uh, CounselorBill1 at gmail.com. Thanks again, Bill. Much appreciated. So much appreciation to you, Bill, for taking the time to be on the show and uh, sharing your story with us. Good luck on that second book. I will definitely be checking it out when it comes out. Once again, Bill's book is called Making the Low Notes, A Life in Music. You can find it anywhere there are books, including on Amazon. If you want to know more about Bill 
or if you are interested in his therapeutic services and you are in the Chicago area uh, or the state of Illinois, please contact BillHarrisonTherapy.com or you can email him at uh, CounselorBill1 at gmail.com. Thanks again, Bill. Much appreciated.